Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marius Papeftemiu. I'm the Dean for the Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences. I want to welcome you all to today's uh, ICS Distinguished Lecture. The ICS Distinguished Lecture Series on Information, Technology, and Society brings to campus once or twice a year a highly influential scholar uh, who spans, whose work spans not only computing, it spans uh, multiple disciplines way beyond the, the, the computational space. Uh, today we are thrilled and honored to have with us uh, Professor Alvin Roth. Uh, Professor Roth is uh, the Craig and Susan McCaw, Professor of Economics at Stanford. He will be talking to us about his work on matching markets. Uh, I know many of us in the audience are familiar with his work, and it is the work that gave him or resulted in the Nobel Prize uh, in 2012. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to hear from Professor Roth what uh, he has to share with us, his insights in this very, very exciting space. I'm not going to take more time. I want to acknowledge the School of Social Sciences, which is co-sponsoring the event. I also want to acknowledge the Center for Algorithms, Complexity, and Optimization, which is also co-sponsoring along with the School of uh, Information and Computer Sciences. I will now want to, would like to invite Professor Vijay Vazirani to introduce our speaker. Vijay. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here to talk to you today. Uh, so so it's, it's meant to be a talk for a general audience, so I'm going to talk a bit about markets and, and what they do, and then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that I'm currently engaged in and, and how it's looking. So I wrote a book on all this. I, I signed some of them outside before lunch. And the thing about books on markets, think about any books, is after they've been out for a little while, they get translated. And that reminds us that marketplaces are a lot like languages. They're human artifacts. They're ancient human artifacts. And often we don't think of them that way. We think of languages as something that just comes to us and, and we can't easily modify. If I spoke to you in modified English, you'd have trouble understanding me. If I wrote the book with, with rationalized English spelling, you'd think I was illiterate. But, uh, but of course, language changes. We have lots of words like computer and smartphone and uh, internet that we didn't used to have. And markets change as well. And just as there are 
lots of different kinds of languages, lots of different languages, there are lots of different kinds of markets. And often when we think about markets, we think about commodity markets, which are a great market design invention, but not all markets are commodity markets. But, but in order to point that out, let me take a moment to think about commodity markets, which really are a, a great human invention. So here's a picture of the building in which the Chicago Board of Trade resides. And the Chicago Board of Trade is a commodity market, but commodities are an invention, right? They're a design feature of markets. You can buy wheat on the, commodity board, on, the, on the Chicago Board of Trade. And God made wheat in lots of varieties. But the Chicago Board of Trade sells number two hard red winter wheat in units of 5,000 bushels. And that's a commodity that you don't have to inspect. All those adjectives, number two, hard, red, winter, tell you exactly what you're going to get. And so you don't have to worry about who you're dealing with. All the Chicago Board of Trade has to do is discover the prices at any moment during the day that clear supply and demand. And you don't worry whether the person you're buying from has taken good care of the wheat. The wheat may not be planted yet. You can be buying future wheat. Okay. So on the top of the Chicago Board of Trade is the Roman goddess of trade, Ceres. And Ceres was a, a fine custodian of that market when there were people in trading pits shouting at each other and, and signaling, gesticulating to each other what they wanted to trade. But today, Ceres doesn't supervise that much of the market. Here's a microwave array on top of the Aeon Center. And this can communicate in, in um, eight milliseconds back and forth with the New York Stock Exchange. It takes you about 200 milliseconds to blink your eyes. Right, so, so eight milliseconds is very fast. It's faster than human speed for anything. And indeed, many of the trades on the Chicago Board of Trade, on the stock exchanges these days, are algorithmic. And that changes the nature of the market. It's not going to be my subject today. But the rules of who gets which trades might have to be adjusted when you're having algorithmic trades. And the, one of the ways securities exchanges make a lot of their money these days is by renting out space in the data centers where the exchanges are, because the speed of light is a limit on, on how quickly you can get information. So having your computers within very short cable length of the New York Stock Exchange computers allow you to do some kinds of algorithmic trading that you couldn't otherwise do. So, that's not going to be my subject today. But my point, the reason I raise it, is that while markets are ancient human technologies, technology changes the way we can design markets. And it's easy to think about that when you think of some of the new marketplaces that we see today, like, like eBay and Uber. So eBay, to my way of thinking in this accelerated time, eBay is much older than Uber. And what do I mean by much older? eBay came into existence with the internet. As soon as there was the internet, you could start selling people things who live far away from you. Instead of emptying out your attic and putting things on the lawn and selling to people who came by the things that you found in your grandfather's trunk, you could now sell them around the world. That was a good internet market. But you couldn't use the internet to do what Uber does. Uber had to wait for smartphones, because to call an Uber you need to know where you are. It ha you have to be able to call it from wherever you are. You can't be waiting at your desk with your computer. Uh, and Uber has to know where you are, and it has to know where the cars are. So we needed global positioning satellite technology. We needed portable computing. So Uber is a marketplace for, so eBay is a marketplace for stuff. Uber is a marketplace for transportation. They use different technologies. And the te new technology made each of them possible, but it's different new technology. So we're going to see markets responding to changes in technology. Now, as I say, not all markets are uh, commodity markets. right? You don't care when you're buying 100 shares of AT&T, you don't care who you're buying them from. But when you're getting an Uber, you would like it to be close to you. So there's a matching function that has to go on as well, not just that lots of people would like cars and lots of drivers would like passengers. We'd like them to be close to each other so that, that there's not a lot of time spent waiting on either side. Uh, and in general, in many markets, you care who you're dealing with. right? The, uh, in some of the, the most important markets, you care who you're dealing with. So they're not cleared by price alone. right? All you need to do to buy shares of AT&T is find the price that buyer and seller agree on. But 
But for Uber, you need to locate a driver and a passenger and put them together. And lots of markets are like that, so, so prices no longer do all of the work. There's also this matching market. And in some of the markets I'm going to tell you about, we don't even let prices do any of the work. So for example, uh, this is supposed to be a picture of this uh, uh, auditorium, which I grabbed from the internet, but it's a little blurry. But I think it's right here. And what I wanted to say to you is, college admissions is not a commodity market. UCI doesn't fill its places by lowering the tuition until just enough people want to fill, or by raising the tuition until just enough people want to come to fill all the seats. Right? You, have, you can't just come to study at University of California, even if you can afford it. You have to be admitted. Okay? And University of California can't decide who will come. You have to compete with other UCs and Stanford and Harvard and all those places. And that's not an unusual market, college admissions. Uh, you can't just show up for work at Facebook. You have to be hired. Okay? And Facebook can't just decide who's going to work there. They have to compete with Google. So these are matching markets, markets in which you can't just choose what you want, even if you can afford it. You also have to be chosen. And so matching markets are a lot like marriage. You can't just choose your spouse. You also have to be chosen. And there's courtship involved and, and exchange of information. So, uh, so prices alone aren't going to do the work. You can't just know the price. You have to know, when, when you admit someone to, to UCI, you admit a specific person. You don't just say, here's the price. Anyone who wants to pay it can come. So college admissions, labor markets are, are not a commodity market. I dare say that even when UCI hires professors, they don't do it by lowering the wage until just enough professors want to come. <laughs> Although I understand that's a sensitive point. But deans, think about that. Uh, <laughs> OK, so, uh, so there are some general lessons you can talk about, about that marketplaces have to accomplish, whether they're commodity markets or matching markets. And I'm going to tell you about a few markets, and you might help. You might think about these things as I'm, I'm telling you about them. First thing a marketplace has to do to, to make a market work well is it has to make the, the market thick. Enough people have to come to the marketplace so you can find efficient transactions. So when you think about eBay, you need buyers and sellers. And they didn't start by selling everything. They started by selling a, a smaller menu of things that they could concentrate a market in. Similarly, Amazon started to make a thick market in books. And it only later became a market in everything. Um, and of course, markets like Uber have to attract both passengers and drivers. If there are lots of passengers but no drivers, then the passengers won't get served very well. And if there are lots of uh, drivers but few passengers, then the drivers won't make very much money. So, so one of the jobs is to make, things, make the market thick. But when you have a thick market, sometimes there's congestion. There are so many transactions that you might need to consider that it's hard to consider them all. Think about Amazon, and suppose they didn't have a good search engine. There'd be no way to buy anything on Amazon. Everything is for sale on Amazon, but you wouldn't be able to find it. So Amazon has menu organizations. They're in departments, and they have search. And they're curating that search, of course. What you find when you, when you look for my book uh, depends on not just what you type in, but how they've decided to, to treat that particular search. So they're, they're helping you the way a supermarket helps you by organizing things in aisles so that you don't have to look at every item in the supermarket before deciding what to buy. So successful markets, the ones we think of, have all figured out how to deal with congestion. And you know, if you're Uber, for instance, there's a matching algorithm that's trying to pick the, the the set of drivers for the set of passengers that will get people where they're going as quickly as possible. And finally, of course, markets have to be safe and reliable. And that's a special challenge, maybe, for markets that take place in cyberspace instead of in bricks and mortar. Because when you, it used to be when you went to a bank, you could tell it was a reliable bank by the, by the architecture. They had a, a big lobby with, with marble floors and pillars and, that, and a big safe that you could see from the uh, from the vestibule, and that showed you that this was a solid bank that was going to not run away with your money. But now you might be depositing your money on the internet, so you need other ways to know. You need reputation mechanisms. You need uh, secure ways to send money uh, so that you know that it's a safe and reliable market. So all of those are things that, that I think I wasn't too surprised to find out about marketplaces as I started to, to study them, that they needed to be thick and uncongested and safe. 
the thing that, that surprised me the most, I think, and that I'll spend some time talking about, to you, talking about to you today, is that not everything that economists can think of that, that seems like it might be a good idea seems like a good idea to everyone. And so, uh, so some kinds of transactions are repugnant. And, and I'll talk more about that in particular because I'm going to tell you about some of my work on, on kidney transplantation. And one of the big facts about kidney transplantation is there aren't enough organs for transplant, but you can't pay someone for a kidney just about anywhere in the world. The, the single exception is in the Islamic Republic of Iran, where they have a, a monetary market for kidneys. But, but by and large, you can't buy a kidney, or you can't legally buy a kidney. So I want to talk to you a little about repugnant transactions and maybe about black markets as well, because sometimes when we ban markets, we, we don't really make them go away. We, we create, we're, we're designing black markets when we ban markets sometimes. So those are the, the general things I want to talk to you about. And as Vijay mentioned, I uh, have designed some, some relatively unusual markets along with some uh, more prosaic ones. Um, if you know someone who's graduated from medical school in the last 20 years, they, they go through a match that, that's much older than 20 years, but, but in its most recent form, um, it uses an algorithm that I designed. And part of the issue is, one, one reason they needed a redesign is, is they have this very interesting centralized clearinghouse that was designed to promote thickness in the market. The, the problem they used to have in medical marketplaces was that uh, medical students who are a very clear group of people and who all become residents as their first job, uh, they would be approached at diffuse times throughout their medical school career. So, you, so they often had to decide to accept a job offer without knowing what other job offers would come along if they, if they waited. So partly to, to solve that problem, the doctors coordinated on a time at which uh, the markets would act. But but new forms of congestion arose. When, when they first started to, to think about clearing houses in the 1950s, just about 100% of American medical graduates were men. And today, 50% are women. And last year, of the 17,000 medical graduates, 2,000 of them were married to each other and wanted two jobs. And searching for two jobs can be harder, but we now make it easy for them to do. And that's, that's become a safe and reliable market. And something similar to that mathematically similar, uh, goes on with assigning children to schools in a bunch of American cities. And the big, the big problem there, I'm not going to talk at great length about either of these markets, the big problem there was safety. It turns out in many schools where they have school choice, they ask the families, what, where would you like your kid to go to school? Because the whole idea of school choice is that families have some valuable information about which schools would be good for their children. But in many cities, they ask that question in a way that made it dangerous unsafe to answer truthfully. And the way they would do that is, is in, in, with the most benign intentions possible. They would say, you know, we're going to assign children to schools, trying to give as many children as possible their first choice. And then when we can't give you your first choice, we'll try to give as many children as possible their second choice. And when there are ties, when there are more first choices than there are spaces in a school, we'll use some kind of priority system. We'll know which children have priority to which school, if an older sibling went to the school or, or if you live near the school. So that sounds great. It's clearly beneficent. They're trying to help families. But what makes it unsafe to confide your true preferences to the schools is if you don't get the school that you said was going to be your first choice, there's an excellent chance that the school that is your second choice will already have filled all of its places with people who said it was their first choice. And you might have very high priority for your second choice school, but it's too bad because they've all already filled their places. So in many American cities, we've now fixed that. We've, we've designed school choice systems that have the property that if you don't get your first choice, your chance of getting your second choice is just as great as if you had said it was your first choice. And that makes the market safer. But today, in my limited time, I'm not going to talk to you about those. I'm going to talk to you instead about, about kidney exchange, which um, is maybe the most unusual of the markets that, that I've helped to design and which I'm still very actively involved in. And remember, kidney exchange, kidney transplantation, you know, that's me in the, in the yellow <laughs> thing, um, is, um, is shaped by the fact that you can't buy kidneys. So, so I'm going to get to a more detailed description. But basically, this morning, there are 100,000 people in the United States 
subscribe on, on the waiting list for a deceased donor kidney. And last year, we only had 14,000 transplants from deceased donor kidneys. So we're not, we don't have nearly enough supply. And when economists look at, at, at 100,000 people waiting in line for something that comes at the rate of 14,000 a year, we sort of say, gee, you know, probably the price mechanism isn't being allowed to help increase the supply. And indeed, it's not. The law, I'll show you a phrase of the law, the law requires that the price of a kidney be zero. Kidneys have to be gifts. But to th so I want to talk to you about that and about what we've done about it to, to, to help increase the, the number of kidney transplants. And to do that, I want to take a step back from kidneys and talk about other repugnant transactions. Because when I talk about kidneys, it sounds like something very special. And I think it's not so special, but that we economists haven't spent enough time trying to understand which markets get social support and which don't. So let's call a transaction repugnant if some people would like to engage in it and other people don't think they should be allowed to. Okay, so that's too broad a definition because economists have for a long time talked about markets with negative externalities, right? I might want to open a discotheque next to your house and there might be plenty of people who would like to come and have loud parties at three in the morning next to your house as my guests, but we understand why you don't want me to do that and why the zoning laws don't allow me to. It's because it would harm you. It would interfere with your enjoyment of, of sleeping in your house at three in the morning if we were having loud parties next to it. But so I'm, I'm interested in focusing on transactions that some people would like to engage in, others think they shouldn't be allowed to, even if it's not obvious that there's any harm done to those people who object. And one way I sometimes say this is, is even if the people who object won't know that the transaction has taken place unless they're told. So that doesn't mean there are no negative externalities of any sort, but it certainly means they're hard to measure, maybe even hard to notice. Uh, and of course, we're all familiar with some. Think about same-sex marriage. Okay, you all remember the you know since 2000, only in 2004 in Massachusetts did same-sex marriage become legal in any American state, and um, before that in in 1995, here's a map that shows where there were bans on same-sex marriage. It turns out it wasn't widely against the law in the in the in the legal code to to marry someone of the same sex. It's just that when you went to the courthouse and asked for a marriage license, they wouldn't give you one if, if you were the same sex. So around 1995, we started to see some political agitation to allow same-sex marriage. And the first results were, that, were not that it became legal by 1998, but, <laughs> but that it became widely illegal. Lots of states passed laws against same-sex marriage. And I think of same-sex marriage as, in some sense, a prototypical repugnant transaction because two people want to marry each other. Other people don't think they should be allowed to. But you don't know whether two people are married unless they tell you. That's why many people wear wedding rings to tell you that they're married, which you can't otherwise tell. So in 2004, Massachusetts legalized same-sex marriage by the, the Massachusetts Supreme Court, that's not its name, uh, found a, an equal protection clause in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Constitution. And, but but there now not only are states mostly gray, some of them are black. They've, they've passed a constitutional amendment that says in their state, a marriage is between one man and one woman. So they are trying to preclude the courts from doing what happened in Massachusetts. Uh, nevertheless, in 2009, there were a few more states, but now we're going all black there. But by 2014, b between the courts and the legislators, there was wide legality of same-sex marriage. And in 2015, the Supreme Court decided that equal protection for American citizens now meant marriages in any state should be recognized in every state. So, so repugnances can change, but of course we're not through with this in the United States. You know, you know, years from now we'll remember to our children that we just became nicer in the 21st century. But it was a tough battle, right? And and there are still cases going through the courts on on you know, must must bakers bake wedding cakes for same-sex marriage if they object to them, things like that. So so repugnance is a is a big deal. We're, we're changing marijuana laws in the United States lately. So here's another map of legal and illegal. You know, bright green is, is legal marijuana. Um, dark green is medical marijuana is legalized. That was recently the case in California, but we went bright green. And gray is marijuana is largely illegal. And as you know, the 
current administration in Washington is committed to making America gray again. But, <laughs> but, but it's going to be hard, because if you're a state trooper in Idaho, you know, in the upper left-hand corner, sort of surrounded by places where marijuana is legal, it's going to be a lot less fun arresting people on the highway because they bought edible marijuana in Washington and are driving to California to consume it, and it's legal in both places. Right? You're, it used to be that when you made a drug bust on the highway and you got back to the police barracks, your, your colleagues patted you on the back and said, you know, you're a righteous policeman, you made a good arrest. And now they're going to say, you know, you arrested someone for having gummy bears in, in uh, still, you know, unconsumed gummy bears in their car with, with cannabis in them. So, I predict that we're not going to make America gray again. They're going to make America green. It's going to be hard to enforce laws against cannabis when there are so many venues that make them legal. Now, it's hard to tell what's repugnant and what isn't. But one of the regularities, and I'm coming quickly to kidneys, is often something isn't repugnant until you add money. right? So if you wanted to give me a kidney, that would be really nice of you. I don't need one, thank you. But, but, but I mean, if you want to give someone a kidney, that would be really, really nice of you. If you sold them a kidney, you'd be a felon. Okay, I mean, it's a felony in the United States. So, so money really changes how we think about many things. And even economists understand that there may be transactions for which money is not as helpful as it is in other transactions. Many, here's a New Yorker cartoon, and many people can pick out the economist in this picture. He's coming to a dinner party, and he didn't bring a bottle of wine, and instead he says, you know, this is what we would have spent. And of course, that's one of the places where we don't use money, right? If you invite me to dinner at your house, there's lots of ways I can show my gratitude. I could bring a bottle of wine. Even a, an extravagantly expensive bottle of wine would be gratefully accepted to, to show that I appreciated the dinner. The one thing I can't do is after, uh, after the dinner, I can't say, you know, you are such a wonderful cook. That would have cost at least $100 at a nice <laughs> restaurant here. Can I just leave it under my napkin? You know, and you'd think to yourself, not a restaurant, you know, what, what does he think? And, and to unpack that sentence a little bit, when I go to a restaurant and I buy a meal for $100 and I pay my bill, I have completely extinguished my debt. I don't have to invite them to dinner at my house. I don't have to bring them a bottle of wine. I don't have to be their friend. Whereas when you invite me to dinner at your house, that's not meant to be a commercial transaction. That's meant to be an act of friendship. And I'm not supposed to extinguish my debt. I'm supposed to invite you to dinner sometimes. Right? So, so, so indeed, everyone understands that money isn't appropriate equally in every transaction. Okay? But, and this kind of big economic consequences. For centuries in the Middle Ages, uh, the Catholic Church didn't think that people should uh, charge interest on loans. And of course, we could hardly have the global capitalist economy that we have today if we didn't have markets for capital. And in Islamic jurisprudence, with, where, where there's still concerns about charging interest, there's all sorts of clever market design in what's called Islamic finance, where there's ways to get things that are very much equivalent to a mortgage, but instead of paying interest, you're paying rent. You become a co-owner with the bank of your house. And, and indeed, you know, there are halal financial instruments that work a lot like mortgages without, without charging interest. So, so those things are important. Another map where, where California stands out is uh, surrogacy laws. And this is one where a lot of surrogacy law around the world has to do with paying or not paying. So in California, where we live, surrogacy is fully legal. You could hire someone to bear a child for you. Okay, And that's got all sorts of legal precedent and regular contracts, and you could have your name and, and your spouse's name as the parents on the California birth certificate. Okay, But in Canada and in many parts of the world, and including some, parts, some states in the United States, surrogacy is legal, but you can't pay the surrogate. So of course, there's much less surrogacy in Canada, and there's a lot of fertility tourism to California. In parts of Europe, surrogacy is simply illegal. In Italy, a child was seized and put up for adoption by another family to, as a way for the Italian courts to show that they didn't approve of surrogacy. So we're all over the place on this. But of course, when you think about market design, you know, there in the state of Washington, you can't pay a surrogate. But you can in California. So I'm not quite sure what the effect of this law in Washington is, but it doesn't stop anyone who needs a surrogate from having a surrogacy, because you can come to California. 
right? And just incidentally, this relates to same-sex marriage. One of the big customer groups for surrogacy are male couples who don't have a, a uterus between them. Although my transplant surgeon colleagues, when I once gave a, recently a, a surgical grand rounds and said something like this, they said, oh, you know, the uterus is just a muscle. We could, you know, anyway, let's not, let's not get into that. Okay, so now I want to come to kidneys because that's, that's what I've been leading up to. I want to make a marketplace that is socially supportable for kidneys, which means we're not going to pay for kidneys because it's against the law. Here's the bit of law that makes it illegal to pay for a kidney in the United States. It's, the, it's part of the, the National Organ Transplant Act of 1984, and it's a long law, but, but here's a, a phrase from it. It says, it's unlawful for any person to uh, acquire or otherwise transfer any human organ for valuable consideration for use in human transplantation. Okay, so the phrase valuable consideration has actually been a subject of a lot of legal debate, but for sure what this says is you can't buy a kidney in the United States, buy it or sell it. Okay, so, it's, so this is just one of those things that is not at all repugnant, it's heroic for you to give a kidney to someone you love, because kidneys are special. Healthy people have two kidneys and can remain healthy with one. There's a real shortage of kidneys, so if you knew someone dying of kidney disease, you could save their life by giving them a kidney. But it's a felony for them to give you money in return. Okay, so here's some of the numbers there. Uh, 100,000 people waiting this morning for kidneys, but in 2018, we had 14,000 transplants. Uh, thousands of people die while waiting, right? Kidney disease is one of the top 10 killers, not just in the United States, but worldwide. So, uh, you know, it's a bad disease. Dialysis is far from a cure. It keeps you alive, but, uh, but eventually you can't work. You're, you're, and, and eventually it kills you. I mean, you, dialysis is, you, um, you have an external kidney that, that three times a week cleans your blood, and, and pees for you, right? So one of the things about being on dialysis is your blood volume, the amount of water in your body, fluctuates a lot. Every time you go for dialysis, you, have, you end up with much less blood volume. That means much lower blood pressure. That means real cardiac strain on your heart. That is, you're going from very high blood pressure to very low blood pressure in, in a couple hours. And so that's one reason why people, on average, only live five years on dialysis, although there are people who live much longer. So, so transplants are the, are the right treatment. But we don't have enough deceased donor kidneys. Incidentally, if you have a California driver's license, you can look at it and see whether there's a little pink heart on your license. And if there isn't, you can go to you know, donatelife.gov and, and uh, enter yourself on the, on the deceased donor registry. But most of us will die in a way that doesn't make our organs recoverable for transplant, because dying isn't good for your organs. Um, but as I say, uh, kidneys are special because there are living donations. And in 2018, we had about 6,500 transplants from live donors. Notice that means we have almost as many live donors as we have deceased donors, even though we have only half as many transplants. And that's because living donors only donate one kidney and deceased donors donate two kidneys. Okay, but sometimes you're healthy enough to give someone a kidney, but you can't give it to the person you love because kidneys have to be well matched to each other. And this is what opens up exchange. And here's a, a very simple kind of exchange. Donor one loves recipient one and would like to give her a kidney, but they have incompatible blood types, so it's hard. And normally what, what used to happen is donor one was sent home. Sorry, you can't give a kidney to the person you love. And recipient one had to remain on the deceased donor waiting list in that long, dangerous wait. But what you can see here is there's this other couple available who also can't give a kidney, but, but between the two of them, they could get each recipient a blood type compatible kidney by exchanging kidneys. So today we do a lot of exchanges of this and more complicated kinds. But you might worry that, remember the law doesn't say you can't buy a kidney, the law says you can't give valuable consideration for a kidney. So the question is, something valuable is being exchanged here, it's a kidney, it saves lives. Uh, is it against the law? And the Justice Department wouldn't write us a memo saying that it wasn't against the law. They don't like to write memos saying that things aren't against the law. They, they didn't say it was against the, uh, the law, but they just didn't think it was their job to provide an opinion. So we got an amendment to the, to the federal law which says the preceding sentence, the one about valuable consideration, does not apply with respect to human organ paired donation. And paired donation is a term of art that avoids use of the word exchange for kidney exchange. And the idea is that the, the legal framework 
in which organs are given are called the Uni Uniform Anatomical Gift Acts. Kidneys are gifts, and this is a paired gift. But the thing about gifts, as opposed to contracts, that where consideration, valuable consideration, consideration is a contract word. Uh, the thing about contracts is if I say to you, if you bring me a cup of coffee, I'll pay you a dollar, and then you bring me a cup of coffee, I owe you a dollar. But if I say to you, tomorrow I'm going to give you a dollar, tomorrow I don't owe you a dollar, I could change my mind. That's the nature of gifts, because you didn't give me anything in consideration of that dollar. So, so kidneys are gifts, which means even in an exchange, people could change their mind. So this leads to congestion. Here, I showed you a little bit of this picture before. This is half of a kidney exchange, a simple two-pair kidney exchange, going on in 2006 in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm keeping my hands out of the way, so no one hands me anything. But, and, there's, and there's a kidney in here. And this gentleman, Steve Woodle, before they took the kidney, the, the kidney comes from a nephrectomy that's in an off-screen operating room just right behind us, steps away. Before the nephrectomy uh, took place, he got on his cell phone from the operating room, and he called up Mike Reese in Toledo, Ohio, and he said, Mike, we are ready in Cincinnati. We have successfully anesthetized the patients and made the initial incisions. And if you are also ready, we'll go ahead. And the reason they do that simultaneously is because you could change your mind about a gift. They want to make sure both gifts go through at the same time. Okay, so they do that. But, but as a result, doing that simplest exchange between two pairs requires four simultaneous operating rooms and four simultaneously available surgical teams for the two nephrectomies and the two transplants. So it's a logistically complicated, congested transaction. And it's pretty clear that if we want to do uh, more of these, more transplants, we're going to have to get a, overcome this congestion, as marketplaces do, right? As Amazon has to have search engines so you don't have to look at every item before deciding which one to buy. We knew that if we wanted lots of transactions, we'd have to do them better. And the way we do them better is with non-directed donor chain. So, so here's an article. So Mike Reese, the first author, he's the guy who was in Toledo receiving that phone call. And what he and we observed was that, um, the, the reason we do two-way exchanges simultaneously is, supposing we didn't, and we did um, the first transplant on day one, planning to do the second transplant on day two. But for whatever reason, the second transplant doesn't go through. So one couple has given a kidney and not gotten one. And that really harms them, both because they've had a surgery that didn't help them, but even more important, because they no longer have a kidney to take part in kidney exchange. But it turns out we have a couple of hundred donors a year these days who are non-directed donors. They want to give a kidney to someone, and they don't have a particular patient in mind. And when that's the case, you can start a chain that doesn't have to be simultaneous because it can have the property that each pair gets a kidney before they give one. And that means if the chain is broken, which happens only seldom, about 2% of the time. Um, if the chain is broken, the, the disappointed pair that was going to get a kidney and didn't get one are disappointed, but they're not grievously harmed because they still have a kidney and they can take part in the next kidney exchange. So the very first one that, that came out in 2000, the, the paper came out in 2009, at that point it had 20 people in the picture. Okay? And the, you know, the medical picture is up there. This, this picture is from People magazine and the, the the people identified themselves. They stepped outside from behind their HIPAA protection. And the last lady in the picture, her mom got a kidney, and her name's Helena McKinney, and she's blood type AB. So this was a sort of a mistake on our part. For reasons I'm not going to get into, it's hard to find a good match for a blood type AB candidate in the kidney exchange pool. Um, but she waited three years and was still game when a good match came up and added 12 more people to the picture. But what we do today is we wouldn't ask her to wait three years. We didn't know we were asking her to wait three years uh, at the time. Now she'd be asked to donate to someone on the deceased donor waiting list. About 4% of Americans have blood type AB. There's 100,000 people on the list, so you can always donate to someone on the, on the waiting list if you have blood type AB. Um, so the, the potential cost is much less when you have non-directed donor chains, and the benefits are huge. We now do about half of our kidney exchange transplants Food chains. Okay, here's in 2012, this was the longest chain that has 60 people in the picture. Uh, there have been longer chains. Most chains are shorter. Most, most chains have about 10 people in the picture. Uh, but, but still, that, that gets you a lot of transplants that you wouldn't otherwise get. 
and you know, for you computer scientists in the room, you know, put computing optimal chains is, is an NP hard problem, but, but the instances are solvable. So we need better computational complexity to tell us why, even when the worst cases are very bad, the, the cases we actually experience are, are hard, although there are some difficult instances. It's not that this is uh, you know, the simplex method where all the, all the problems look easy. Some of them look hard, but so far they've all been solvable. Um, so why do we need long chains? Well, we need long chains because lots of patients are highly sensitized. And that actually is a market-wide phenomenon. One reason lots of patients are highly sensitized is that big transplant centers, now that kidney exchange has become a standard form of transplantation, they sometimes, when they have easy-to-exchange pairs, they do them themselves. And they only show the inter-hospital exchanges they're hard-to-match pairs. And hard-to-match pairs are hard to match. And what that means is, Typically, the patient in a hard-to-match pair has a lot of antibodies that prevent them from taking kidneys, even from blood-type compatible people. So antibodies are your, your immune system's way of protecting you from foreign objects. And the chance, if I didn't know my blood type, if I were a random draw from the population, the chance that one of you could take my kidney would be a little bit over 50%. But the chance that my wife could take my kidney would only be 30%. And that's because my wife and I are parents. And in the course of childbirth, her immune system might have been exposed to some of the proteins that our, our boys inherit from me. You get half your proteins from your mom and half from your dad. And if so, she might have some preformed antibodies waiting to attack those proteins, which are what my kidneys are made of. So if my kidney would show up, her immune system would, uh, would attack it. But And there are people who have really really highly sensitized, really lots of antibodies. So when we say that someone has 99% PRA, uh, percent reactive antibodies, what we mean is they can only take 1% of the blood type compatible kidneys. Okay? So let's think why long chains are important. Here's a, a snapshot of data from, from one of the kidney exchanges, from the Alliance for Paired Donation. And the way we're representing the data is each circle represents a pair, a patient donor pair. And an arrow goes from one circle to another if the kidney could go from the donor in the first pair to the patient in the second pair. And everyone in this picture, oh, every circle is a patient and a donor, everyone in the picture has blood type A. Okay, so there are no blood type incompatibilities here. But nevertheless, what you see is there are only eight blue circles that have lots of incoming arrows. Those are the easy to match pairs. They're going to be easy to match, and they'd be easy to match with each other. But it would be wasteful to match them with each other, because the way you match hard-to-match pairs is by matching them with easy-to-match pairs. So let's think why, uh, why chains are important. Supposing everyone in the room represents a hard-to-match pair, so we are all a uh, uh, highly sensitized patient and a donor. What's the chance that we can give you a kidney? Well, the chance that we can give any one of you a kidney is small, because you're highly sensitized. You can hardly take any kidneys. But in a big room like this, the chance that we can give somebody a kidney is not so small. So we can give you a kidney, you know, somewhere in the middle. What's the chance you can give us back a kidney in a two-way exchange? Well, it's very small, because we're highly sensitized. But the chance that you can pass it on to someone else in the room is not so small, because there's lots of people in the room. The chance that they can pass it on, that they can pass it on. So that's how we make a long chain. And to ignite that long chain, you need a, a non-directed donor. So, so that's where we're, getting, we're seeing a lot of these. Whoop, I did something wrong there. OK, so um, here's the growth of kidney exchange in the United States. The, the people in, in the middle of the chain and the people starting the chain. So, so you can see that it's, it's grown steadily. You know, the, 2000, the, the first chain I showed you started in 2007, was published in 2009. Various other technological advances have made other advances. And so, so we do about 15% of the living donor exchanges in the United States now happen through exchange. So if I stopped here, I could have told you about, you know, victory after victory, but it's in a war that we're losing, okay? When I started working on kidney exchange, the, there were about 40,000 people waiting for deceased donor kidneys, and today there are 100,000. So, so that's not as good as it should be. And in addition, it's not just an American problem, it's a worldwide problem. Uh, kidney disease is a, is a top 10 cause of death around the world. Uh, there was a time in which low and middle-income low and middle countries didn't 
record a lot of deaths due to kidney disease because infectious diseases were, were killing people much younger. But today we're all getting richer and enjoying the same diseases. So millions of people die every year uh, through not getting proper treatment for kidney disease. And you can see, here's a graph, a sort of worldwide graph of per million deceased donations per million population and living donations per million population. And you can see that there are countries in the world where there are excellent hospitals, that is, they do transplants, but they're not doing a lot. And a lot of those causes are financial causes. That is, uh, in the Philippines, the, the national health insurance doesn't cover um, transplantation. So, so and, and they don't even cover continuous chronic dialysis. They only cover acute dialysis. So if you live in the Philippines and are not a wealthy person, uh, kidney failure is a death sentence. So the question is, can we bring patients from, from middle-income countries into American kidney exchange? And remember, we have all these hard-to-match patients. So we're not talking about something that's simple medical foreign aid. We're talking about mutual benefit. That is, we have lots of people waiting to exchange kidneys who, because they're highly sensitized, the market isn't thick enough for them to find someone. So the question is, can we bring people from, for example, the Philippines, uh, where, where there might be easy to match pairs who are, who are perishing from kidney disease because it's transplant isn't widely available. So the first pair we, we started to explore this with are uh, Jose and Christine. Uh, here's the, the picture of their chain. The chain starts, so, so here's Jose and here's Christine. The chain starts with an American type A donor who was hard to start a chain with for, for various reasons, but is compatible with Jose. Christine is blood type O. That, that's a a uh, lucky blood type to start a chain with, and she's able to start a chain that has lots of, of people in it. So, uh, you know, years later now, I think they're at their fourth anniversary or fifth, they're healthy in the Philippines, and, and they're sitting there with an escrow fund that sits in Toledo, Ohio, that pays for their continuing medical expenses. She needs annual exams. He needs immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, they're both doing fine. If, if I were giving this talk to a surgical audience or if one of my surgical colleagues were, we'd, we'd tell you just how fine they're doing. But they're doing fine. Um, and why is this feasible, right? It, I mean, it could be feasible just with philanthropy. But the reason it's feasible is roughly a, a transplant cost over five years, a transplant followed by, by immunosuppressive drugs for, for the rest of your life, a transplant uh, costs about as much as one year of dialysis. So when you give someone a transplant, you, it, it doesn't cost more than you would have spent on them anyway. But now, for the rest of their lives, you have very much reduced costs. So some part of the American healthcare system saves a lot of money whenever a hard-to-match American is transplanted. And it's that money that can finance uh, uh, global kidney exchange. And this makes global kidney exchange really special when you think about medical engagement with foreign countries, because mostly when you talk with foreign countries, what you're talking about is foreign aid. We should, because we're a rich country, we should spend money helping uh, other countries with their health problems. And, and when you talk about that, you never talk about transplantation, because most countries, especially low and middle income countries, have much more pressing uses for an extra dollar than transplantation. When I was, when we were first looking into this, I went to uh, Lagos in, in Nigeria and had a conversation with the then Minister of Health in which I asked him, if you had an extra dollar, how would you spend it? And he said, if I had an extra dollar, I would spend it on educating people that when they don't feel well, they should go see a Western-style doctor rather than a, a folk doctor because we're not seeing these people until they're at death's door. They only come to the the modern medical system when, when everything else has failed and then it's, it's very late in their disease. So the thing about kidney exchange is it doesn't cost us anything to invite at least some of these patients into American kidney exchange because we have all these hard to match patients. It, it helps us and it helps them. So it's a kind of mutual aid. Now, the medical logistics aren't going to be the hard part because there are repugnance constraints. Right? As soon as you start talking about living donors from poor countries, people start thinking of black markets, of which there are, there are black markets and kidneys. I visited one in Baku in Azerbaijan. And, and they're, not, they're not things you would want to endorse. You know, in Baku, young women come from Ukraine and Moldova, and they're committing a crime 
in their country of origin, they're committing a crime in Azerbaijan, they go in and out, they go home immediately, they're not, they're not, the donors are not signed up for medical care where they are, so, so they don't get such great care. Um, so that's not the way you'd want to do it, but some people look at that and say, you know, you just bought these guys from the Philippines, aren't you just being part of a black market? Uh, which, of course, we're not. I mean, I hope I've, I've explained it, but that doesn't mean that, that repugnance isn't a real thing that has to be dealt with. So we published a paper on this in uh, the American Journal of Transplantation, a good, good journal of transplantation, and they published it. But in the same, oh, and, and Mike Reese is the lead author, and again, there are some economists in there. Uh, but, in, but they published it, and in the same issue, they published an editorial that said, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. You know, there, there are potential ethical problems that maybe we should just step back from this. Uh, and, and there are two kinds of repugnant reactions we've gotten. These come from my, uh, well, they come from my emails and website. Uh, and, and the first one says, the plan is, is not about the international recipient, but only about getting organs for U US citizens, so it's exploitative. So, so the, the, the first criticism sort of criticizes our intentions. It says, you're just America first kind of guys. Uh, the third world has plenty of experience with imperialists who come and exploit their resources. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing an America first kind of thing. And the second kind of criticism says, let's solve problems at home first. In other words, America first. Uh, you know, we should encourage programs that allow Americans to help Americans, which of course we should do, and of course we do do, and I've just been telling you about some of them. Uh, but, but I mean, these are, are passionate reactions. Now, at the same time, we've gotten a lot of endorsements from the American Society of Transplantation, from, from all sorts of people. But some of the, what makes me optimistic about this is, we get endorsements from the places where it matters. So here's a Mexican chain. Here's the Mexican pair. Uh, they've also identified themselves, but, um, but, but here I don't identify them. But, but they're in the middle of a chain, and this chain would have ended with this lady whose, uh, whose, whose mother got a kidney. And this lady is 67 years old, and that turns out to make American surgeons a little bit reluctant to take her kidney. That seems silly to me. I'm 67 years old. Uh, but, uh, but for whatever reason, she, we were having trouble continuing this chain, and she would have been asked to give to someone on the deceased donor uh, waiting list, which would have been fine. I mean, we, we, we have lots of success with transplants of people over 70. Uh, typically, she'd give to someone who was, who was older. Uh, but she gave to, to the Mexican pair, and, it, and that extended the chain somewhat further. And here's the cover story in Newsweek on Espanol, you know, following that chain. And what it says is it says, uh, transplants of kidneys between the US and Mexico, a bridge of life. And the, the first paragraph, inexpertly translated, says, just as US President Donald Trump is seeking to build a wall of thousands of miles on the border with Mexico, a tireless surgeon and economist join forces to exchange organs between citizens of both countries. So, so in Mexico, it looks like a good thing, even if it doesn't always look like a good thing to, to all of our colleagues. So I'm, I'm pretty encouraged. And I was just, and, and when you talk about, is it really feasible if we can get it organized? It is, because, because high quality surgery exists in all these places. It's, it's the organization and the financial ability that doesn't. So I was just in Ahmedabad, which is a city in Gujarat in, in the west of India. And there's a, an excellent hospital there called the Trivedi Institute of Kidneys that, that has done, has our software and is doing kidney exchange and they'd like to extend it statewide. And they can do that. And part of the reason is I sat in on a very, very modern 21st century operation in Ahmedabad uh, last month. And the surgeon, you know, this is one where I came in and the surgeon who's, who's sitting there is not scrubbed in. I'm not scrubbed in and he's not scrubbed in. And he got up and he shook my hand and he's not wearing a glove because, because the sterile field is, is, you know, 15 feet away and he's operating a robot. And the robot gives him both a lot of precision and a lot of magnification. So it's a really high quality surgery done in Ahmedabad. He's 15 feet away from the patient, but with better, more reliable, safer internet connections, he could be in a different hospital, right? The, the patient is surrounded by general surgeons who are, who are taking these things in and out, but they're being controlled at the robot, which he operates incidentally with his hands and his feet. Um, so it's, it's pretty remarkable, the, the quality of surgery 
around the world is much greater than the availability of transplantation for other reasons. So let me end with um, just two challenges that, you know, often people ask me, what are some markets that need redesign? And, and, let, and let me think about uh, some of them. Uh, and remember, I said to you that when we make things against the law, we, we generate black markets. So indeed, there are black markets in kidneys, and they don't work very well, any more than black markets in alcohol worked during prohibition. But of course, now that we've legalized alcohol again, uh, we don't buy, you can't buy rot gut, you know, moonshine whiskey from gangsters, right? Now, if you want to buy whiskey, you have to go into nice liquor stores and you buy aged, you know, scotch whiskey from, from Scotland because the legal market outcompeted the illegal market. Well, think about heroin uh, and, and opioids generally, fentanyl and things like that. We hate heroin and, you know, as we should, I think. We, we can all agree that we would really like a world with no heroin addicts. But that isn't what we've got. We, we've got a war on, on uh, heroin, and over 40% of our federal prisoners are, have drug convictions. So our prisons are full of, of people who are dealing in the black market. But I'm sure that within 10 miles of where we're sitting, if we knew what we were doing, we could buy heroin you know, here in California. Not, you know, not very far and not very expensively. Nevertheless, you know, so not only is there a lot of heroin, we have a lot of drug overdose deaths. But there are places in the world, like Portugal, where they treat heroin addicts more like patients than like criminals, and they have fewer overdose deaths. So even though we hate heroin and wish we didn't have any addicts, here's a market that might be able to use some redesign. We had you know, 60,000 overdose deaths last year in the United States. Uh, something about our design for, for the heroin market isn't working well. Okay, another market that isn't working well a real matching market, is refugee and migrant resettlement. Here's a, a, a line from a poem by the British Somali poet, uh, Warson Shire. She says, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Right? There are people trying to get to Europe in little rubber boats across the Mediterranean. There are people trying to get to the United States walking across Mexico from Guatemala. Uh, when you and I want to go to Europe, we take an airplane and we, we you know, walk dry foot into Europe from an airport. So there's something very wrong with, with the way we're handling human migration. And human migration isn't going away, especially if, if the sea level rises in the next 50 or 100 years. But of course, as we all know, there's a political problem here. You know, Brexit was, was in large part excited by repugnance to immigration. Uh, here's a, a Hungarian. Did you know that, you know, Brussels wants us to take illegal immigrants? And of course, in Washington, we're no longer we're no longer friends of immigrants either. So not every market that needs redesign is ripe for redesign. But we had better be learning from our mistakes now because large-scale human migrations are not going to go away. And we are going to need to know how to deal with them better than we deal with them now. So market design is, is not just about, it's, it is about, but it's not only about designing ride sharing and, and pricing and uh, you know, advertising auctions. It's also about Lots of things that we don't always think of as, as markets, but that we design by the rules we make. And, and a market's design are its rules. And they're among the most important human artifacts that, uh, that affect our lives. Thank you. one. Now, apart from that, it's tough. You know, one of the things, one of the matching things about, about refugees is right now we and lots of countries try to assign refugees once they're admitted. That's a big deal. But once they're granted asylum, we try to assign them more or less randomly. And there's this general idea that if, if foreign migrants are distributed uniformly around the country, they will assimilate invisibly. But when you come to the United States, you can get on a Greyhound bus and go wherever you want. So we have Somali communities, Somali Americans in Minnesota and Maine, for instance. And it's not because they like snow. It's because there, there were Somali communities already there. So when we think about immigrants, we often have to think about communities. And, and we should think carefully about how we match them and, and where they are going to sit and how they're going to get assimilated. Because 
because it's a matching market. Not only can't refugees choose where they're going to get asylum, but um, but we can't choose where refugees are going to live. And there are European countries that have more muscular ways of telling people where to live, but they still have trouble. So right now in Sweden, they're trying to match refugees to where there's housing. But where there's housing is in the north, where jobs are in forests and mines, and, and the reason there's housing is Swedes want to move to the south. And turns out so do people who didn't grow up where there are forests and mines. So I think we have to think harder about how we handle refugees, even the ones we grant asylum to. always seem to be exact, you know, in the sense that, you know, my blood type doesn't change, so I'm a typo of forever. But there are, there are other situations where the attributes that you're seeking to match may be dynamic. Absolutely. Or may, uh, one may subsume another, but not uh, reverse. Um, can you share any thoughts or insights as to, do those, those make for different markets and if so how? Well, so, so, in school choice, one of the things school districts are interested in is the balance, the ethnic balance, the you know, various kinds of population characteristics of schools. So of course, those change with who you've already enrolled. Um, kidneys, you know, I presented it as if it were very static, but which kidneys are compatible with you is partly a choice of your doctors. And if your situation deteriorates, more kidneys become compatible and they exercise those choices. And it's a big, big deal trying to get them to convey the decisions they're going to make before, before actually being offered a kidney and then refusing it. Um, certainly, you know, some of the big uses of market design are things like online, a online ad auctions, things like that, or, or discriminatory pricing for airline seats. And those change all the time. When you try to get, when you go on Expedia and try to get an airline seat, they have an algorithm that looks at how many, even if, the price, if, even if the flight is a month in advance, they have some idea of how they're doing a month in advance and whether they want to offer you a discount seat or not. So, so there's plenty of dynamic matching. Those problems are harder. Yes. So, so no, no, not the patient. So you, when you register for a California driver's license, could register to be a deceased donor, but you will not become a donor until you are deceased. And in the context of the chain, someone was 69 or 67. Right. So, so the, the question that I just got was, was, you know, whose kidneys will you take? And often, the way we now ask surgeons that question is with a threshold language. We say, for each of your patients at this moment, tell us what's the oldest donor you'd accept, what's the highest body mass index, what's the highest blood pressure, what's the, the lowest creatinine clearance, you know, a bunch of things like that. And often they tell us, I mean, they're, they're, they're trying to get kidneys for their patients, so they give us pretty generous things. They say, I take a, a kidney from a 70-year-old. But when we show them an actual 69-year-old, they, what they say is, when I said I'd take a kidney from a 70-year-old, I was thinking of a former Olympic athlete who's remained in perfect shape and has you know, uh, you know, low blood pressure, and you're showing me a lady who has moderately high blood pressure and is smaller, you know, I, I would have wanted a bigger person because my patient is bigger, you know, things like that. So, um, so we were having trouble. I mean, surgeons were not taking her kidney. She was 67, and, and I think small was part of the problem. And the, the woman she gave to was a small woman. And that matters. Size matters. Uh, you know, what, what, one of the important features of your kidney is called its nephron mass, which is just how much the, you know, how much the working part of the kidney weighs. And um, more is better. And, but the bigger you are, the bigger kidney you need. We have one last question. Uh, so you made a connection between uh, migrant resellers and sea level rise. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could, um, if you have any thoughts on market design uh, to respond to climate change. Oh, well, sure. Carbon taxes. I mean, you know, it's just the politics you have to solve. Everything else is easy. Uh, yeah. So, no, no. Lots of markets that need redesign are not ripe for redesign. So the thing about carbon taxes is they would, uh, you know, stop substitution of one thing from another to, that, that were equally 
difficult. And you know, carbon taxes could work at the border. You know, you, if we had a carbon tax, we could then put tariffs. You know, our current administration likes tariffs on things that that hadn't had carbon taxes where they were produced, things like that. So, so having a uniform way to talk about carbon, which is the big, not the only, but but um, you know, the the big factor in climate change, I think, would be a way to help. If, if you thought there was a stable regime of climate change, of, of, of carbon taxes, you could start to plan your production. What kind of cars should you build in the future? What, all of those things. So, so I think, unfortunately, even though there's a good deal of consensus among economists about what would be a, a sensible way to address climate change, I, I'm not optimistic. Yeah. My question is related to that. So do you think that all these uh, tariffs uh, Customs policies, uh, also cheap labor markets, matchmaking with the big consumer markets. Uh, do the tariffs really do a good job in trying to redesign or regulate how the markets? No, tariffs are a terrible tool for, for regulating trade. Uh, they're they're going to cause a lot of pain, but mostly to us. Um, you know, but but um, you know, one of the big progress that I mean, I'm not a trade economist, so I'm speaking as an informed amateur. But um, one of the big progress we've made is with big, you know, not bilateral, but, but, but multilateral trade agreements to try to make trade more efficiently. There's no reason we should grow bananas in the United States. We should import bananas from people who can grow them more efficiently. And similarly, all these other trade things that we do uh, are, are good for the world. Now, we're not great at, that doesn't mean that, that globalizing markets is simultaneously good for everyone. One thing that we are not good at in the United States is, is saying, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have lots of winners and a few losers, let's take care of the losers from the winnings. We, we do a bad job of taking care of the losers. So when I moved to Pittsburgh in um, 1982, uh, lots of steel mills on the Ohio River Valley were closing down. And if you were a middle-aged steel worker, you never got as good a job again once, once they closed down. Uh, but your children who are in high school, they're not missing those jobs. Those were hard, dirty jobs, and they're now working in hospitals and in tech and in service industries. So uh, similarly, in 1900, more than half of Americans worked in agriculture. Uh, and you know, big combines came in, and, and people who got displaced from agriculture, many of them never got as good a job again, and they migrated to cities and worked in sweatshops and things like that. But we're not missing those agriculture jobs today. So, so a lot of these things that are good for everyone in the long term are not good for everyone in the short term. And we, as a society, have not been good at taking care of the people who are, who are taking the bullet for the rest of us. So that's certainly something to think about, and that's part of the politics as well. But, but in general, having tariffs um, you know, it's a bad idea. We, sh we shouldn't be growing bananas in hot houses in New York. You know, we should be buying them from people who live in warm countries where it's cheap to grow bananas. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, okay.